Now we come to chapter 17, and we've now come to the chapter that in many ways, and a great many consider it one of the outstanding chapters of the Bible. Now, before we get into it, I'd like to just make, as it were, a recapitulation of what we've said along, that God tested Abraham. God appeared to him seven times. And we've noted that there were certain failures in the life of Abraham. But also there were successes. And actually, there were seven tests that God gave to Abraham. We saw, first of all, that God called him out of Ur of the Chaldees, his home. And Abram responded partially. His faith was weak and imperfect, but at least he moved out. And we find that Abram finally arrived safely in the land of Canaan, and God blessed him. Then the famine in the land of Canaan, that was the second. And Abram fled from the land of Canaan to Egypt, and he acquired riches and Hagar that we've just been talking about. And both were a stumbling block. Then the third test, Abraham was given riches. And they are a real test. They've been a stumbling block for many a man, by the way. The riches, I've always, frankly, wished the Lord had let me have that kind of a test than some of the others that I've had. But nevertheless, I'm of the opinion he couldn't have trusted me with them. Abraham actually didn't forget God, and he was certainly generous and magnanimous toward his nephew Lot. But it separated him from Lot, and God appeared to him. Then we saw Abraham was given power by the defeat of the kings of the East. That is a real test. He happens to be the conqueror. And this man, Melchizedek, met him, and I think that strengthened Abraham for the test. And so he refused the spoils of war. And God appeared to Abraham and encouraged him. Then we have the fifth test. God delayed giving Abraham a son by his wife, Sarah. And Abraham became impatient, and through the prompting of Sarah, he took matters in his own hand and moved outside the will of God. Then you have the birth of Ishmael, and the Arabs of the desert today will still plague the nation Israel, and they'll keep right on doing that, I think, until the millennium. Then the sixth test we'll see later was at the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. And then the seventh one will be the offering of Isaac. Now, this more or less gives us the picture that is before us. Now, let's come back here to this 17th chapter in view of the fact it's such a remarkable chapter, and as we've said, a great many actually feel that this is the outstanding chapter of the book of Genesis. Well, God here makes his covenant with Abraham and changes the name of Abram to Abraham. And God also confirms his promise to Abraham about a son. He lets him know that Ishmael is not the one that he had promised him. Now, in one sense, this chapter is the key to the book of Genesis. It actually may be a key to the entire Bible. God's covenant with Abraham concerns two important items here, a seed and a land. And God reveals himself to Abraham by a new name, El Shaddai, the Almighty God. And also he gives Abraham a new name. And I've been calling him first Abram and Abraham, but up to this point, actually, his name was Abram. Now it's changed to Abraham. Abram means high father, and Abraham means father of a multitude. Ishmael is not the son God promised Abraham. That is the thing this chapter makes very clear. Now let me come to chapter 17 and read in your hearing. 
And when Abram was ninety years old and nine. Think of that. He was eighty-six years old when Ishmael was born. And it was not until about thirteen years later, well, in fact, it was fourteen years later when Isaac was born. When Abram was ninety years old and nine, the Lord appeared to Abram and said unto him, I am El Shaddai, I am the Almighty God, new name, walk before me and be thou perfect. This is the picture that's given to us. And I will make my covenant. And thirteen times in this chapter we find the name covenant. And in 27 verses, for that to appear 13 times, obviously means God's talking about the covenant. That is very important. Listen to him now. And I will make my covenant between me and thee, and I will multiply thee exceedingly. Now, this is God's fifth appearance to this man. Not only his fifth appearance to this man, But now he comes not only to make the covenant, but to reaffirm the promise that he has made, which absolutely, of course, rules out this boy Ishmael. And I'm not sure, but what that's one of the very important reasons why it was like that. Now you find that Paul, writing in the fourth chapter of Romans, the 19th verse, he said this, And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body, now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. Now, Sarah's womb actually was a tomb. It was the place of death. And out of death came life. Isaac was born, and... Paul concludes that fourth chapter by saying, he says, He was delivered for our offenses. He was raised again for our justification. Life out of death. And that is the promise now God is making to this man. He is 99 years old. And that means that Sarah was 89 years old. When Isaac was born old, Abraham was a hundred years old, Sarah ninety. Now God goes on to say, And Abram fell on his face, and God talked with him, saying, As for me, behold, my covenant is with thee, and thou shalt be a father of many nations. You'll be a father of many nations. Now we have here the father of many nations. I suppose that it could be said that he's probably had more children than any other man that's ever lived on the earth as far as we know. Just think of it, for 4,000 years, two great lines, the line of Ishmael, line of Isaac, and there have been millions in each line. What a family. What a homecoming. And Added to that, there's a spiritual seed. And we are called the children of God by faith in Christ. And Paul in Romans 4, 16 says, Speaking of Abraham, says, Who is the father of us all? That is, of believers, and also of the nation Israel, and also of the Arabs, by the way. Just think of the millions of people. I tell you, this man here... God says, I'm going to make you a father of many nations. Now, God's made that good. This thing was said 4,000 years ago. And he goes on to say, Neither shall thy name any more be called Abram, but thy name shall be Abraham, for a father of many nations have I made thee. Now, the word Abram means high father, a father of the height, exalted father. And Abraham means, as we're told here, father of a multitude. Now, suppose in that day, and now I'm injecting a little story in here to illustrate this, to show you something of the faith of this man Abraham. 
Now suppose one morning that Abraham and Sarah got up, and they were working around the tent, and all of a sudden out at their little oasis where they had a spring there at Hebron, and the well that he had there, why, there appear a group of traders. They've come down from the north, and they are on the way down to Egypt. And they want to know if they can water their camels. And Abraham goes out to meet them. There were a great deal of hospitable people in that day, by the way. It's quite interesting. We speak of the cave man of way back yonder and how terrible he was. May I say to you that in that day, a stranger couldn't go through the country without somebody had opened their home and they would entertain him. If you came into Los Angeles, a stranger, friend, and knew nobody, I don't know anybody would take you in. Frankly, I don't. And there are a lot of Christians in this area. Our culture is altogether different today, but we certainly lack the hospitality they had in that day. And Abraham went out to meet them, said, sure, help yourself. Said, I'll feed you stock. And would you like staying for a while? And they said, no, we're in a hurry to get down to Egypt. We're on a business trip. And one of the men says, my name is Allah. And the other one says, my name's Allah Baba. And they said, what's your name? He says, my name is High Father. <laughs> and they said, my boy or girl. And Abram said, well, I don't have any children. He said, you mean to tell me that you don't have any children and your name is Abram? And he said, yes, my name is Abram. And so they laughed. They said, how in the world can you be a father and not have children? And they ride off on the desert laughing. And they come back six months later. And when they come by again, Abram goes out to greet them again, and they said, they all begin to laugh. Hello there, high father. And he said, my name's not high father anymore. Oh, they said, what is it? He said, father of a multitude. And they said, my, must have been twins. And Abraham says, no, I still don't have any children. And then they really laugh. They say, how ridiculous can that be? Well, here is a man who was a father before he had any children, and it's Abraham, and he's that by faith now. But 4,000 years later, where I sit and where you are listening right now, we can say that God sure made this good. The name stuck, if you please, and he's still Abraham, the father of a multitude. Now God says in verse 6, And I'll make thee exceeding fruitful, and I will make nations of thee, and kings shall come out of thee. Has God made that one good? He certainly has. Now in verse 7, And I will establish my covenant between me and thee and thy seed after thee in their generations for an everlasting covenant. Now what kind of covenant did God make with Abraham? An everlasting covenant. Well, if it's everlasting, is it good today? It certainly is. You see, God promised you and me everlasting life if we had trust Christ. And that's a covenant God made. And my friend, if God's not going to make this one good he made to Abraham, you better look into yours again. But I have news for you. He's going to make yours good but he's also going to make Abraham's good. But we'll have to wait next time to see this covenant. And now today, friends, we return back to the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis. If you have your Bible, will you turn there to the 8th verse? Now, last time, you'll recall, we said that the 17th chapter of the book of Genesis is the key chapter of the book. Some think of the Bible. At least it's an outstanding book. That is, this chapter is. And the thing that's important here is the covenant. Thirteen times the word covenant occurs. God makes his covenant here with Abraham. And there are two things that are in the covenant. God promised him a seed. He'd be the father 
of many nations. And second, he give him a lamb. Now, we're looking at that last part. Verse 8, And I will give unto thee and to thy seed after thee the land wherein thou art a stranger, all the land of Canaan, for an everlasting possession, and I will be their God. And again, there's something that's important in this covenant. God tells him what he will do. God says, I will. I will make thee exceeding fruitful. I'll make nations of thee. I will establish my covenant. I will give unto thee and thy seed. And I will give you this land for an everlasting possession. Now, we notice the word everlasting before. And that means God has made a covenant with these people that's an everlasting covenant. And since it is, it's not one that'll be easily broken. It's not one that's going to run out. God gave them an everlasting, an everlasting possession. Now, they have been in that land on three occasions. It's theirs. But the important thing is they only occupy it under certain conditions. And God, first of all, sent them down into the land of Egypt, and they were dispersed there, and that's where they became a nation. They went down a family, about 70, came out a million and a half at least. And then they were put out at the Babylonian captivity because they went into idolatry, were not witnessing for God. Then we find that they went out again in 70 A.D. After they had rejected their Messiah, they went out of that land. And actually, they've never been back. Three times God predicted they'd be put out of the land. Three times he said they'd be returned. they have been returned twice. When they return the next time, I take it that it means that they'll never go out of it again, at least. That's when the millennium takes place, is when God gathers them and brings them back in the land. I do not consider the present return to the land a fulfillment. I rather regard anyone that makes that statement dealing with sensationalism, and there's so much of that in prophecy today, an attempt to make it very sensational. Well, it's sensational enough if you just take it as it is. But the important thing is we ought not to be adding to it or have God say something he didn't say at all. Now in verse 9, and I'm reading, And God said unto Abraham, Thou shalt keep my covenant. Therefore thou and thy seed after thee in their generations. This is my covenant, which ye shall keep between me and you and thy seed after thee. Every man-child among you shall be circumcised. Now, that's the badge of the covenant. They didn't do this in order to become a member of the covenant. They did this because they had the covenant from God. And there's all the difference in the world. That's the same place that good works occupies for the believer today. You do not perform good works in order to get saved, you perform good works because you have been saved. And may I say it's all the difference in the world. As a boy, I remember when I went away from home, I did get in a lot of trouble. But the one thing that kept me from going, and I think becoming an absolute renegade, was the fact of my dad. I said, because I'm a son of my father, I won't do this, or I won't enter into this. I refrain because of that. Now, I didn't become his son because I didn't do certain things. I was already his son, but because I was... Now, that's the badge of the covenant is circumcision. The thing that put them under the covenant wasn't circumcision. That was the badge of it, the evidence of it. And God gives this to them now. And verse 12, and he says, He that's eight days old shall be circumcised among you. And if you'll notice how meticulous the record is concerning the birth of Christ, how all the law was fulfilled in connection to the birth of this little baby, that he was a son of Abraham. 
He was the son of David. He was in the line. And on the eighth day, he was circumcised. He was born under the law, Paul says. Now, will you notice, God says here that he that is born in thy house and he that is bought with thy money must needs be circumcised. And my covenant shall be in your flesh for an everlasting covenant. That's the badge of it. They didn't have to do that in order to get the covenant. God had already made it for them. And I trust that you see that. That's so important to see. The same thing is true today. A great many people think, well, if I join the church or if I'm baptized, I'll be saved. No, my friend, you don't do those to get saved. Now, if you are saved, let me say as a pastor, I think you'll do both of them. I think you'll join the church. And I think you'll be baptized, but you don't do that to get saved. We need to keep the cart where it belongs, following the horse, and not get the cart before the horse. In fact, the horse is in the cart today for the thinking of many relative to salvation. Now, in verse 14, "...and the uncircumcised man-child whose flesh of his foreskin is not circumcised..." That soul shall be cut off from his people. He hath broken my covenant. Now, you see, the fact that there were those that disobeyed, and you'll find out that practically the entire nation had disobeyed when they came out of the land of Egypt. But the thing was, that did not militate against the covenant. It just meant that individual would be put out. But as far as the nation is concerned, no individual or group could destroy this covenant God had made with Abraham and his seed after him. It's an everlasting covenant. That man has broken the covenant. He's put out, but the covenant stands. That's how marvelous it is. And God said to Abraham, As for Sarah thy wife, thou shalt not call her name Sarah. And I have actually been pronouncing it incorrectly all through here. And I'm not about to change it. It's Sarai would be the correct pronunciation before Sarai. Well, if I'd started saying Sarai, somebody would have written to me and said, What's happened to you? You're speaking. You don't seem to be able to speak very clearly. Well, it was Sarai before. Now it's changed to Sarah. And I will bless her and give thee a son also of her. Yea, I will bless her, and she shall be a mother of nations. Well, if old Abraham's going to be a father of nations, then Sarah's going to be a mother of nations. Kings of people shall be of her. Then Abraham fell upon his face and laughed and said in his heart, Shall a child be born unto him that's a hundred years old? And shall Sarah that's ninety years old bear? Old Abraham, he just laughed. Now, it's not the laughter of unbelief. I think it's the laughter of just a sheer joy that this could happen. You know, every now and then in our lives, God does something for us that's just so wonderful. I'm sure you had that experience, that you just feel like laughing. You don't know anything else to do but just to laugh about it. Well, this man Abraham didn't dream this type of a thing could possibly happen. You put yourself back in his position and you will find out that this is just something unheard of. Now, it was the deadness of Sarah's womb, and he was dead. Have you ever noticed how Paul described that? I think I should turn to Romans 4 right now and share this with you. Verse 17, as it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God, who quickeneth the dead, calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, He considered not his own body now dead when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness 
of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what he had promised, he was able also to perform, and therefore it was imputed unto him for righteousness. You see, Abraham believed in God, and he just absolutely is overwhelmed by the wonder and the goodness of God. But then, all of a sudden, a thought comes to him, and it's like an arrow to his heart. You know what? He thinks of a little boy that's his by the name of Ishmael. Let me read verse 18 now of Genesis 17. And Abraham said unto God, O that Ishmael might live before thee. Abraham is saying now, O Lord, this little fellow that's been growing up in my home, he's attached to him. He was 14 years old when Abraham sent him out. And you'll find he sends him out a little later on. And the boy was 14 years old. And I don't think Abraham ever saw him again. Broke his heart to send this boy. After all, friends, I don't care what you might think of Ishmael. He was Abraham's son. And Abraham loved his son. And it is a heartbreak for him to have to give him up. I'm of the opinion that he thought many, many times, I made a great big mistake in taking Hagar. You see, that was a sin that... Not only plagued him, friend, but look over in that land today. There's been trouble in that land from the beginning. Why? Because Abraham sinned. Don't tell me sin's a little thing, or sin is something you get by with. My friend, the fruits of sin, God says, Be not deceived. God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. Not something similar, but just that. And this man Abraham is certainly reaping. Oh, that Ishmael might live before thee. And God said, Sarah thy wife shall bear thee a son indeed. In other words, God says, no, I won't accept him. That was wrong. And friends, don't come along now because it's in the Bible and say, well, now God approved polygamy. He's just condemning it as much as he possibly can. I can't see his approving of it at all. And thou shalt call, I'm reading verse 19, thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I'll establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant, and with his seed after him. And as for Ishmael, I've heard thee. Behold, I've blessed him, and I will make him fruitful. I'll multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget, and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant will I establish with Isaac, which Sarah shall bear unto thee at this set time in the next year. In other words, God holds to the promise that he's made. God is not to be deterred or deferred from this at all. He's going to do the exact thing that he said he would do. And he speaks as if, Isaac's already born and already in their midst. But he speaks of things that are not as if they are, and it's going to be the next year. Now we find verse 22, And he left off talking with him, and God went up from Abraham. In other words, Abraham, you just well keep quiet. No use any longer. God has already decided this. And friends, there are times... And there are things that you and I just will not tell the Lord about in the way of petitioning him. There are certain things you don't need to ask the Lord. There are certain things that you don't need to keep after him. There are times when you've said enough and you don't need to say any more. I'm of the opinion that a great many folk just pester the Lord sometimes in a prayer, and they already have the answer, which, of course, is no. Now, God says to Abraham, let alone now. This is enough. You needn't mention this anymore. I have not accepted him, and I do not intend to. Now, God's going to hear the prayer of Abraham a little later. We're going to find out. God listened to Abraham. But there are certain matters 
And I find a great many people today, they pray about things that maybe God doesn't intend to hear or answer at all. And I'm very careful. I try to be very careful today about asking people to pray about certain things. I want to at least feel like there's a reasonable chance of God hearing it and answering. Now, we find verse 23, and this reveals the interest Abraham had in this boy. And Abraham took Ishmael his son, and all that were born in his house, and all that were bought with his money, every male among the men of Abraham's house, and circumcised the flesh of their foreskin in the selfsame day as God had said unto him. And Abraham was ninety years old and nine when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. And Ishmael his son was thirteen years old when he was circumcised in the flesh of his foreskin. In the selfsame day was Abraham circumcised and Ishmael his son And all the men of his house, born in the house, and bought with him of the stranger, were circumcised with him. Now, this is the badge of the covenant that God has made with Abraham. Now, somebody's going to say, well, Ishmael, why was he included? Well, hasn't God promised he's going to be a great nation also? May I say he's included in it in that sense. But he's not to be the one that God had promised Abraham at the beginning. He's not to be the father of the nation that God will use and the nation through whom the Messiah will come. That's very important to see at this juncture. In fact, it's all important. Now, that brings us to the 18th chapter. And actually, the 18th chapter here is a chapter that this one and the next You wonder why it's included in the Bible, actually, until you get to the New Testament. And I think we'll see why later on. And this is, of course, the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, will you notice it's a rather lengthy chapter. Well, I say lengthy, 33 verses. But I'm going to hit now some high points in this chapter and probably in the next chapter also. But this is very important to see. You see in chapter 18 what could be called a blessed life, and you could see in chapter 19 down in Sodom and Gomorrah a lot blasted life, all because of a decision that was made. Now I'm reading verse 1 of chapter 18, and here God tells Abraham about the judgment of Sodom and Gomorrah and Abraham's intercession on behalf of the cities of the plain. And this is an illustration, I think, of blessed Christian life in fellowship with God. And the Lord appeared unto him in the plains of Mamre, and he sat in the tenth door in the heat of the day. You see old Abraham down there now in Mamre. He's an old man, by the way. And he lift up his eyes and looked. And lo, three men stood by him. When he saw them, he ran to meet them from the tent door and bowed himself toward the ground. Notice the hospitality that Abraham extends. Now, the little story I told last time, you see, has a basic of fact at least. I don't think it ever took place, but the point is this man was a very gracious, hospitable man. And he said, My Lord, if now I found favor in thy sight, pass not away, I pray thee, from thy servant. Let a little water, I pray you, be fetched, and wash your feet, and rest yourselves under the tree. Now, you see what he's doing. Of course, that seems very strange to tell a stranger that comes to see you, wash your feet and come in. We wouldn't quite say that today. But that was an old, probably the oldest custom that is known. Remember, yonder in the upper room, our Lord washed the disciples' feet. Has a tremendous spiritual message there. And here, you see, Abraham says, wash your feet. That is a token of real hospitality, is when someone comes into your home and takes off their shoes, their feet are washed. And by the way, in that day, they didn't take off their hat, but they did take off their shoes. Today, we've reversed it. You come in to visit somebody, leave your shoes on, and take off your hat. I'm not sure which is right, 
I like the idea myself of taking off shoes. I like to go in summertime barefooted. I wish it were possible. When I'm out in the Hawaiian Islands, I put my shoes up and I wear these little thongs about and go barefooted as much as possible. I don't even put my shoes back on the whole time I'm there. I'd love to go barefoot. I think this was a great custom. It sure made you feel at home to take off your shoes and wash your feet and rest yourself under the tree. Abraham's really entertaining them royally. And he says, I'll fetch a morsel of bread and comfort ye your hearts. After that ye shall pass on, for therefore ye come to your servant. And they said, So do, as thou hast said. And Abraham hastened unto the tent unto Sarah and said, Make ready quickly three measures of fine meal, knead it, and make cakes upon the herd. And Abraham ran unto the herd, fetched a calf, tender and good, gave it unto a young man, he hasted to dress it. And he took butter and milk and the calf which he had dressed, set it before them, and he stood by them under the tree, and they did eat. Isn't that a marvelous way of entertaining in such a royal way? But we'll have to leave off there, and we'll join Abraham's party next time. Now, if you have the notes and outlines that we send out, follow along with us. We're in the 18th chapter of the book of Genesis. And as we said last time, as we entered this chapter, it seems that chapter 18 and 19 are rather detached from the story of Abraham. You wonder why it's put in here. But it actually is very important in many ways, which we'll have to reserve for a later date to talk about. But we find in chapter 18, we're with Abraham, and we see here a picture of what a blessed Christian life could be. And then in chapter 19, you can see actually when we go down to Sodom and join Lot down there, what a blasted Christian life is. And unfortunately, we have today both kinds among Christians. There are those today that have made really shipwreck of their lives. They have gotten entirely out of the will of God. And I wouldn't even suggest for a moment they've lost their salvation, but they sure lost everything else. And as Paul says that they are saved so as by fire. Now, will you notice that we are with Abraham in his entertaining guests? We left off last time with Abraham having prepared a sumptuous bounty. He took a little calf, a servant killed it and prepared it, and the chef cooked it up, and they had veal steaks or veal roast, I imagine, and all the trimmings that went with it. They had, we are told here, butter and milk. My, it was a real feast. And these three guests Abraham entertains. And then we find that these guests are royal guests. Later on, we'll find out in the New Testament that it's suggested to us that some have entertained angels unawares. That was Abraham. He didn't know who he was really entertaining. Now, will you notice verse 9? And they said unto him, Where is Sarah thy wife? And he said, Behold, in the tent. It wasn't proper in that day. And as you know, even in the East today, for the wife to come out and be the one to entertain, especially when there were three male guests there. And now they ask about her. They make inquiry. And he said, I will certainly return unto thee according to the time of life, and lo, Sarah thy wife shall have a son. And Sarah heard it in the tent door which was behind him. Now, Sarah had her ear at the keyhole, I think, and she has been listening in. And they discover now, both Abraham and Sarah, that they are entertaining angels unaware. Now Abraham and Sarah were old, verse 11, and stricken in age, and it ceased to be with Sarah after the manner of women. Therefore Sarah laughed within herself, saying, After I am waxed old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also. 
That is, is it possible that I'll have a son? And she laughs. Now, what kind of laughter is this? Well, I think this is the laughter that's just too good to be true. That's all. And again, may I remind you that I'm sure most of us have had experiences like that also. God has been so good to us, and on a certain occasion we just laughed, as Abraham did. And then something happened that is just too good to be true. Just too good to be true. And that was the way Sarah laughed. But it frightened her, because the Lord said unto Abraham, Wherefore did Sarah laugh, saying, Shall I of a surety bear a child which am old? Is anything too hard for the Lord? This is just something too good to be true. It just can't happen to me. Is anything too hard for the Lord? At the time appointed, I'll return unto thee according to the time of life, and Sarah shall have a son. Then Sarah denied, saying, I laugh not, for she was afraid. And he said, Nay, but thou didst laugh. <laughs> she couldn't avoid the truth here, and she certainly is rather evasive. And now will you notice verse 16, And the man rose up from thence and looked toward Sodom, and Abraham went with them to bring them on the way. In other words, Abraham didn't have a front gate, so he walked out with them a little farther than the front gate to bid them goodbye. And as they walked out, where Abraham lived, you could look down at Sodom and Gomorrah. I know that when we were in that land, it was amazing to me on a clear day how far you could see. That is, you can see from Jerusalem to Bethlehem, and from the ruins of old Samaria you can see to Jerusalem, and you can see the Mediterranean Sea, and you can see the Sea of Galilee. And you can see Mount Hermon most any place. It's tremendous. Now, the thing that is taking place here, Abraham walks out a ways with these guests, and they see Sodom and Gomorrah, the great resorts of that day. And it must have been a very delightful place to be, a beautiful place. Now, will you notice? The Lord said... Shall I hide from Abraham that thing which I do? Now, up to this point, the Lord has not revealed to Abraham what he's going to do with Sodom and Gomorrah. He's going to destroy him. Shall he hide from Abraham that thing which I do? And will you notice the reason now God's not going to hide it from Abraham? Verse 18, Seeing that Abraham shall surely become a great and mighty nation, and all the nations of the earth shall be blessed in him. Now, Abraham's going to have a tremendous influence. He's going to influence multitudes of people, and succeeding generations will be influenced by him. And that's true right here today on this radio. We're talking about Abraham. He's influencing all of us, friends. We can't avoid it. Now, God says, I better not hide it from him, because he'll get a wrong impression of me. Verse 19, For I know him, that he will command his children and his household after him, and they shall keep the way of the Lord. And this man Abraham, by the way, had discipline in his household, to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. Now, he said, I better tell Abraham. And the Lord said, because the cry of Sodom and Gomorrah is great, and because their sin is very grievous, I'll go down now and see whether they've done all together according to the cry of it which is come unto me, and if not, I will know. In other words, God is saying now to Abraham, Abraham, I know the situation there, but I'm going down to investigate. And God never does anything hurriedly or hastily. And I'm going to destroy the city. It's a good thing God told Abraham this, because Abraham would have got a wrong impression of God. And that is that God was rather dictatorial, vindictive, and that he was one that apparently showed no mercy at all or consideration of those that were his. 
Abraham would have really had a distorted and warped view of God. And so what happened was that God lets him know now what he's going to do. And Abraham has a time now to turn this over in his mind. And it's a good thing God told him, because he did have a wrong idea of God and of Sodom and Gomorrah. He was wrong about many things. And that's one of the reasons that God is telling us as much as he tells us. A lot of things that he doesn't tell us, but he's told us enough. Though a man be a fool and a wayfaring man, he needn't err therein. Now will you notice what happened? The men turned their faces from fence and went toward Sodom, but Abraham stood yet before the Lord. Abraham is now waiting before the Lord. And Abraham drew near and said, Wilt thou also destroy the righteous with the wicked? Now what was the first thing that entered his mind? The first thing entered his mind, of course, was Lot. He'd rescued him once. Now he's in danger down there. And he's wondering, I think he'd wondered about Lot and his relationship to God many times. But he at least believes he's a saved man. And he's asking God, what about the righteous? And after all, Abraham, I think, would have told you that there were many people he thought in the city of Sodom that were saved. And he couldn't understand God wanting to destroy or that he would destroy the righteous with the wicked. What a picture we have here. He says, Peradventure there be fifty righteous within the city. Wilt thou also destroy and not spare the place for the fifty righteous that are therein? Now Abraham begins with fifty. He says to the Lord, Lord, suppose there are fifty righteous down there in Sodom. Would you destroy the city if there were fifty righteous? And you know that it's quite interesting. Will you notice this? He keeps on. That be far from thee to do after this manner, to slay the righteous with the wicked, and that the righteous should be as the wicked. That be far from thee. Listen to him. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? Then may I say that's still a question that many people ask. Shall not the judge of all the earth do right? And there's an answer to it. The rest of the Bible testifies to the fact that the judge of all the earth always does right. Now, whatever God does is right. And if you don't think he's right, the trouble is not with God. The trouble is with you and your thinking. You're thinking wrong. You don't have all the facts. You do not know all of the details. If you did, you'd know that the judge of all the earth does right. We are wrong. He's right. And the Lord said, If I find in Sodom fifty righteous within the city, then I will spare all the place for their sakes. And Abraham thought that over. And Abraham answered and said, Behold now, I have taken upon me to speak unto the Lord, which am but dust and ashes, peradventure, there shall lack five of the fifty righteous. In other words, he says, if there are forty-five there, would you destroy the city for forty-five? And God told him, if I find there forty and five, I'll not destroy it. And this makes the man a little bit bold. And he said unto him again, he says, suppose there are forty. And the very interesting thing is, God says, I won't destroy it for forty. And Abraham keeps on bringing him down. He says, how about 30? And God says, well, if there are 30 there, I still won't do it. And he says, suppose that there are 20 there, I'll not destroy it. And, well, Abraham's overwhelmed now, and he takes another plunge. He says, suppose there are 10 there, would you destroy it if there are 10? God says, if there are 10 righteous in the city, I won't destroy it. And we're told at this point, And the Lord went his way as soon as he had left communion with Abraham, and Abraham returned to his place. Now the question arises, why didn't he come on down below ten? I'll tell you why. At this point, he's afraid Lot is lost. And this disturbs him a great deal, so he's not going to come down any farther. 
But he could have come down, friends, to one. He could have said, Lord, if there's one in that city that's righteous, would you destroy the city? And you know what God would have said? If there's one that's righteous in that city, I'm going to get him out of that city because I wouldn't destroy it if there's one righteous there. And you tell me, you say, how do you know that's the way it had been? Because that's the way it worked out. There was one righteous man there. Abraham didn't believe it, but God knew him. That was Lot. And God said, get out of the city. And God says, I can't destroy it till you are out. Did you know the tribulation, the great tribulation period can't come as long as the church is in the world? Just can't come, friends. Because Christ bore our judgment. And the great tribulation is part of the judgment that is coming. And that's the reason that the church can't go. This is a picture of it. This is a glorious picture, if you please. And believe me, as we're going to see, Sodom and Gomorrah are a picture of the world. And what a picture. <laughs> and what a condition the world's in today, very much like Sodom and Gomorrah. And that does not mean, friends, the Lord's going to come tomorrow because I don't know and no one else knows, but he could come tomorrow, and this certainly would be in keeping with the condition and the carrying out of the picture that is here. Now, that is blessed fellowship with God. It's a picture of blessed Christian fellowship here with God. Now the picture changes. We live up yonder at Hebron on the plains of Mamre, where Abraham dwelt. And now we go down to the city of Sodom, where Lot dwells. Turning now to chapter 19 here, and as I do, I'm reading verse 1. And there came two angels to Sodom at even, and Lot sat in the gate of Sodom, and Lot, seeing them, rose up to meet them, and he bowed himself with his face toward the ground. Now, these two angels visit Lot in Sodom, and they announce judgment. They warn Lot to escape. And we find in this chapter, Lot leaves Sodom with his wife and two daughters. And then we have the destruction of Sodom and Gomorrah, and Lot's wife turns to a pillow of salt. And then we have Lot's awful sin. We'll hit high points here, but so far we're dealing with the verses as we go along, and we'll stay with that. Now you have that which is the blasted life. And don't forget it. This man Lot happens to be a righteous man. Hard to believe it. If I had only this record, I wouldn't believe it. But you see, Simon Peter, in his epistle, he talked about that righteous man vexed his righteous soul. Now, he lived in Sodom, but he never was happy down there. You see, Lot was a tragic day for him when he moved to Sodom. He lost his family. In fact, the matter is he lost all of them when you look at the total picture, and it's tragic. Many a man today may be a saved man, but by his life, and where he goes, where he lives, he loses his family, loses his influence, and loses his testimony. Now, I know Christians like that. I've been a pastor, and I have, in course of time, talked to some of the children of some of the leaders of the churches I've served. It hasn't been too long ago that the son of a leader of the church that I served said all he was doing was waiting for his dad to die in order to repudiate everything. He thought the whole thing was phony, that the Christian life was, and all he could see was hypocrisy and everything. All he was doing, of course, was telling about his home. What a phony his dad must be. And he's lost his son. He's lost his influence, I can assure you, in other places. But I wouldn't question his salvation. I think the man trusts Christ. But by his life, it's rather a phony sort of a life. Poor Lot, how tragic this is. Now let's look at this. And this is a sordid chapter. 
We get two of them in the book of Genesis that are really sorted. This is one of them. Now I'll read on. Verse 2, And he said, Behold now, my lords, turn in, I pray you, into your servant's house, tarry all night, and wash your feet. These men must have had dirty feet. Then, of course, if you'd walk from the plains of Mamre down to Sodom with just nothing on but sandals, your feet would need washing also. But again, I call your attention to the custom of that day, which was practiced by those that extended hospitality to strangers. And he says to them, "'Ye shall rise up early and go on your ways.'" Now, Lot was sitting in the gate of Sodom, and I can't let that go by without calling attention to the fact that the ones who sat in the gate of a city were the judges. Now, this man Lot not only had moved to Sodom, but he got into politics down there, and here he is, a petty judge sitting in the gate. But he's a hospitable man. When these strangers came in, he invited them to his home, and they came in. And they, at first, though, were reluctant. They said, Nay, but we'll abide in the street all night. We'll just stay outside. We don't want to inconvenience you. And they did this for a purpose, of course. He pressed upon them greatly, and they turned in unto him and entered into his house, and he made them a feast and did bake unleavened bread, and they did eat. Now, these men have another feast. They had a feast with Abraham. They now have a feast with Lot. And they brought out something here. They said, we'll stay on the street, sleep in the park. And Lot says, don't do that in Sodom. It's dangerous. Your life wouldn't be worth anything if you did a thing like that. And friends, may I say that maybe Los Angeles ought to change its name to Sodom. It wouldn't be safe for you to sleep on the streets of Los Angeles. In fact, it's not safe to be on the streets of Los Angeles at night. There are many women who live alone. They won't come out to church at night or any program at night. One dear saint of God told me, she said, I just locked my door at Brother McGee and I do not open that door until the next morning by daylight. says it's not safe in my neighborhood to even walk. Well, the days of Sodom and Gomorrah again, and practically for the same reason. And so they bring this out. Lot says, no, man, don't stay on the street. wouldn't be safe for you. And he pressed upon them, and then they came in. Now notice this awful thing, verse 4. But before they lay down, the men of the city, even the men of Sodom, compassed the house round both old and young, all the people from every quarter. And they called unto Lot and said unto him, Where are the men which came in to thee this night? Bring them out unto us that we may know them. May I say this is a sickening scene. To me, this reveals the degradation of this city, the city of Sodom. And this is the name that's been put on that sin from that day to this, Sodom. Now, there was no attempt made, apparently, in the city of Sodom to have a church for this crowd and tell them that they're all right in spite of the fact that they practice this thing. May I say to you that the Word of God is specific on this, and you can't tone it down. This is an awful sin. Now, we're going to see what happens at the home of Lot in the city of Sodom that night. We'll have to wait till next time. If you have your Bible, and we'll turn there to Genesis 19, we are going to pick up at verse 6. Now, this is the chapter in which we see what we have called an example of blasted Christian life. This is an evidence of what today could happen to many believers, and it does happen to many believers This man, Lot, had gone down into the city of Sodom. He did not realize it was the kind of a city that it was. I'm sure of that. But he got down there and found out that perversion was the order of the day. And he brought up his children, his sons and his daughters, in that atmosphere. Now, when he looked down there, and you will recall we saw that he pitched his tent towards Sodom, 
He looked down there. He saw the lovely streets and boulevards and parks and public buildings and the folk on the outside, but he did not see what they really were. Now, the sin of this city is so great that God is going to judge it. God is going to destroy the city. Now, let's draw a pretty sharp line here. There is today a gray area where there is a new attitude towards sin today. And it's not really as black as we once thought it was. And the church today is compromised till it's even pitiful. Right now, the press is reporting in Southern California that we have a church made up of those that are homosexuals. And the pastor of the church, lo and behold, is also one they all admit it. Now, may I say to you, the lesson of Sodom and Gomorrah is a lesson for this generation. Now, God's not accepting this kind of a church. The idea seems to be today that you can become a child of God and you can continue on in sin. God says that's impossible. You cannot do that. And this city of Sodom is an example of that, that you cannot continue in sin. Paul asked the question, shall we continue in sin? And the answer is, God forbid, or let it not be. Paul says that's impossible. And it's this idea today that you can be a Christian and go on in sin is a tremendous mistake, and especially make light of it as I judge it's being made in this particular case. Now, that's what they were doing in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, God destroyed these cities. Now, don't say we have a primitive view of God here and we have a better one today because even after all, Jesus received sinners. He sure did. But when he got through with them, he had changed them. The harlot that came to him was no longer in that business. When she came to God, she changed. That's the thing that happened to other sinners. A publican came to him, and he left the seat of custom. He gave up that which was crooked, and he came to the Lord. I tell you, my friend, if you come to Christ, and I don't care what this generation is saying, and I recognize there'll be a great many people write and explain to me that we're living in a new day and I need to wake up. Well, my friend, we are living in a new day, but it just happens to be Sodom and Gomorrah all over again. Now, I begin reading at verse 6, and probably I should do it without comment. And Lot went out at the door unto them and shut the door after him. Now, the men of Sodom were outside the door asking at these guests that he had that they be turned out to them. Verse 7, and said, I pray you, brethren, do not so wickedly. That's the way Lot looked at it. And he'd been down there a long time. And it wasn't new morality to him, just old sin. Verse 8, Behold now, I have two daughters, which have not known man. Let me, I pray you, bring them out unto you, and do ye to them as good is in your eyes. Only unto these men do nothing." For therefore came they under the shadow of my roof. When a man entertained a guest, in that day he was responsible for him. And the thing was that he was willing to make this kind of a sacrifice to protect them. And they said, this is what that crowd outside, stand back. And they said again, this one fellow came in to sojourn. He'll needs be a judge. You see, Lot was advancing in the political area there. Now will we deal worse with thee than with them. And they pressed sore upon the man, even Lot, and came near to break the door. But the man put forth their hand, pulled Lot into the house to them, and shut to the door. And they smote the men that were at the door of the house with blindness, both small and great, so that they wearied themselves to find the door." And if they hadn't, of course, Lot and these men would have been destroyed, because that was the thought of these men. And the men said unto Lot, Hast thou here any besides, son-in-law, 
and thy sons, thy daughters, and whatsoever thou hast in the city, bring them out of this place. For we will destroy this place, because the cry of them is waxen great before the face of the Lord, and the Lord hath sent us to destroy it. And Lot went out, he spake unto his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and said, Up, get you out of this place, for the Lord will destroy this city. But he seemed as one that mocked unto his sons-in-law. Now this man Lot here is in a very bad situation. He'd spent years now down in the city of Sodom. He'd learned to tolerate this sort of thing, although he calls it wickedness. And he saw his sons and daughters grow up. And they apparently married among the people of that day. And when the time came and Lot got this word from the Lord to leave the city, he went to his sons-in-law and he said, Let's get out of here. God will destroy this city. They laughed at him. They ridiculed him. I suppose they knew that the week before he had invested a little money in real estate there. And they said, We know you. You are wrapped up in the city of Sodom. This is your home. You have apparently applauded these things and approved of them. Do you see this man out of the will of God in this place? There's no witness for God. He didn't win anybody in this city. And when you go down to their level, friends, you don't win them today either. And that's being demonstrated, I think, in this hour. Now, this man Lot, frankly, I would have agreed with Abraham that he wasn't saved. But you remember Peter in Second Peter 2, 6 and 8 says, This righteous man vexed his righteous soul. I tell you, he never enjoyed it down there. Now, he's going to leave the city. He can't get anyone to leave with him except his wife and two single daughters. When the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And while he lingered, the man laid hold upon his hand, from the hand of his wife, from the hand of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful unto him. You see, here's a man that was God's man in spite of everything. And if I only had the book of Genesis, I'm not sure I would believe that Lot was saved. I agree with Abraham. But since Peter calls him a righteous man... And this man had become that way because he had followed Abraham. He believed God, and he had offered the sacrifices. And the Lord being merciful unto him, God had extended mercy to him. And he believes God, and he gets out of the city. Now, it came to pass, when they had brought them forth abroad, that he said, Escape for thy life. Look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain. Escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. And even Lot didn't want to leave. Lot said unto them, O oh, not so, my Lord. Behold, now thy servant hath found grace in thy sight. Thou hast magnified thy mercy, which thou hast showed unto me in saving my life. And I cannot escape to the mountain, lest some evil take me and I die. He'd get out of the city, but he couldn't make it to the mountain. And now he says, Behold, now this city is near to flee unto, in a little place called Zoar. And that's where he went. You see, he came out of Sodom, but this man didn't come clean even out of that. And, of course, he got in a great deal of trouble at that particular time. Now, God destroyed the city of Sodom. And we're told two things here, one concerning his wife, and the other concerning his daughters. The one concerning his wife is that he looked back from behind him, and she became a pillow of salt. Now, that, I think, has been greatly misunderstood. Why in the world did Ms. Lot turn and look back? Well, I think the reason is twofold. She turned and looked back, first of all, because she did not want to leave Sodom. She loved Sodom. She loved Lot, too, but it was a lot of Sodom that she loved. And she didn't want to leave. I think she was a member of the country club, the sewing club, and the Shakespeare club. 
And in fact, there wasn't a club in town that she wasn't a member of. She just loved these little get-togethers in the afternoon. And I'm not sure, but what they met and studied religion. They had a nice little religious club. Oh, she was right in the thick of it all, friends. She didn't want to leave. Her heart was in Sodom. Her body walked out, but she surely left her heart there. Now, that is a tremendous lesson for us today. We hear a great deal, and I hear a great many Christians who talk about they want to see the Lord come, and they're not living like it. On Sunday morning, why, it's difficult to get them to leave their lovely home. And Sunday night, they're not going to leave their lovely home because they love TV, too. They've got a color TV, and they're going to look at the programs on Sunday night because They have some good ones, and they want to see them. They're not going to church. Now, when the Lord comes, friends, you're going to leave the TV. You're going to leave that lovely home. You're going to leave everything down here. I just have one question to ask you. Will it break your heart to leave all of this down here? I ask myself that question many times. I'm not anxious to leave. I'll be honest with you. I'd love to stay. I have my loved ones, I want to be with them. And I have friends, and I want to be with them. And I have this program, and I want to be with it. And I'll be very frank with you. I hope the Lord will just let me stay here. But I also want to be able to say, when he does call, I don't want to have a thing down here that will break my heart to leave. Not a thing. I love my home, too. But I'll be honest with you, I'd just soon go off and leave it. May I say to you, Miss Lot turned and looked back. That's one of the explanations. And then the others, just simply this. Why did she look back? She didn't believe God. God says, you leave the city and don't look back. And Lot didn't look back. He believed God. But Miss Lot didn't. She did not believe God. She wasn't a believer. And so she didn't really make it out of the city. She's turned to a pillow of salt. And I'm not going into the story of the two daughters that's as sordid as it can be. Frankly, Lot didn't do well in moving down to the city of Sodom. He lost everything except his own soul. And, you know, that's a picture today of a great many people that won't judge the sins in their lives. And they're saved, but just so as by fire. And you find that the Lord has said in a very definite way to some of these folk that have put all their eggs in a basket like this, God says that if you won't judge your sin down here, he will judge it. And apparently that was the case in Lot's story. Now, I want to leave this chapter, but I want to leave it by looking at Abraham. What did Abraham think of all of this? Well, let me read verses 27 and 28 of Genesis 19. Abraham got up early in the morning to the place where he stood before the Lord. And he looked toward Sodom and Gomorrah, toward all the land of the plain. And behold, and lo, the smoke of the country went up as the smoke of a furnace. Now, when Abraham looked down there, I think his heart was sad. I'm not sure whether he knew Lot had escaped or not. He probably learned about it later on. But when he looked down there, he probably was sad because of Lot's sake. But Abraham hadn't invested a dime down there. And when judgment came, it didn't disturb him one whit because he wasn't in love with the things of Sodom and the things of the world. You remember what we are told today? Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. I have a message that I give periodically, and the title of it is Sightseeing in Sodom. And I attempt to look at Sodom through the eyes of Lot himself. And he sure had a wrong view of it. And Mrs. Lot, she fell in love with it. And then the view of Abraham. You can sightsee in Sodom with Abraham. He lost nothing down there. Or you can go through Sodom with the Lord and see it as he sees it. And it's too bad that the church is not looking at the sin of sodomy. I don't think it's any greater today than it's been in the past. 
But there is today a tremendous percentage of our population that are homosexuals engaged in perversion. And today we speak of it in a more candid manner than we ever did. In fact, what I'm saying right now, ten years ago I might not have said on the radio. But this is something today that's right in our midst. Now, what's to be the attitude of the Christian toward it? Well, even Lot in his day, he said, you're doing wickedly. And God judged it. Isn't that enough for the child of God to know you can't compromise with this type of thing? This is a sin. And to indulge in it. And then to say, well, this is a sickness. The same thing said about the alcoholic. Sure, he's sick. Of course he's sick. But what made him take that first drink and continue to drink until he became sick? Sin did it, friends. Sin is the problem, and this is a sin. It's so labeled in the first chapter of Romans. God says he gave them up. So Genesis 19 is a pretty important chapter for this present generation that we are living in today, and we need to recognize that.